worship God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, so let's go ahead, and as we're standing, we're going to start worship with uh, the song Remember. <laughs> celebrate that because Jesus paid it all by his death, burial, and resurrection, defeating sin and death in our lives. and pray to find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Oh. Uh-huh. 
heart of soul. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, he washed it white as Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ in our lives. He is our hope. He is our peace. He is our life. And we continue to worship him this morning. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand Round is sinking sand. Oh, it's sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then. Righteousness alone, faultless 
Christ to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So we're going to continue singing this morning. We're going to sing uh, a bridge with all. My hope is in you. All my strength is in you. All my peace is in you. And all my life is in you. He is our foundation. He is the rock that we can stand on no matter what happens in the world around us if we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And all my hope is in you. And all my strength is in you. And all my peace is in you. And all my life is stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand amen will you pray with me father god we thank you for all that you have done for us that you are our rock our foundation that we can stand firm uh, on the gospel that we can share that with others and know that they can hear and be saved uh, God, thank you for all that you do, all that you are working in us, and all this we ask in your great name. Amen. Friday, as you know, most of you know, I'm sure if you're watching, you absolutely know that uh, we, I made the decision because of a possible exposure to COVID uh, on Wednesday that. Uh, we wouldn't have in-person services uh, this morning uh, because of the details uh, of that. We uh, uh, just, I thought that uh, we needed to act out of an abundance of caution uh, just, to, just to give it some time to see if uh, anything materialized. But um, uh, we want you to know that we are still together. We are still worshiping. We're still serving. We're still connecting. We are still, uh, still loving Christ together, and uh, we're glad to be uh, we're glad to be able to come to you this morning and to be able to do this online. God has been good to us, uh, and He continues to be good to us. Uh, all week long, I had a, another sermon, a different sermon that we were going to do this, uh, this Sunday. We were going to uh, go back and revisit what it means to worship, connect, and serve. We were going to refocus upon our mission. Uh, there's a couple of weeks, that uh, these next couple of weeks before we start life groups again, uh, and so we were going to we we're going to dig into that. Uh, um, you know, the last time I preached about uh, worship, connect, and serve, and where that comes from, and and how we see that as our vision here at uh, uh, First Baptist Church to make and grow disciples. Uh, it was September of 2018. I went back to, and looked at it this week, and since that time, we've had almost 60 people join our church. 
Uh, and, and so it was going to do us some good. And we'll do that in the next couple of weeks. We'll, we'll be looking at where that comes from in Scripture, worship, connect, and serve, and what it means as we uh, make disciples and we engage in the commission that Jesus Christ has given us. But today, what I wanted to do is I wanted to... Um, uh, show us, show myself, if, if anything else today, this sermon's probably geared toward me uh, more than any of you all, uh, but to show us that and to show me that we have footholds uh, in the trials that we go through. Now, a foothold and a handhold, you probably know those terms just because of what they signify. They're easy to define. But those terms come from, they come from rock climbing, a foothold and a handhold. And so if you uh, research rock climbing or if you take lessons in rock climbing, you'll be told about what a foothold is and a handhold. And it's pretty self-explanatory. So it's not, you know, it's not, you don't have to use too much brain power to, brain power to understand what that is. Uh, and just to be uh, clear and to make sure that all our cards are on the table, I've never been rock climbing and I don't want to go rock climbing and I'm never going to go rock climbing. I'm, I'm deathly afraid of heights. And so I have, though, read uh, quite a bit about it. And footholds and handholds, of course, are places where you grab hold of the rock and you are, you know, you are climbing to reach the peak or the summit or the top of the rock. And there's a saying that rock climbers have and that is, it's this, it says, good climbers climb with their eyes, not with their hands. And so uh, when you are in the midst of climbing up a boulder or a rock or, and notice I'm, I'm saying all this from, from secondhand experience because I've never been and I don't want to go. But when you're climbing up a rock, you're climbing up a boulder, and you're, you know, they have anchor ropes and all those kind of things. So we're not talking about free climbing here. We're talking about, you know, anchored by a rope, and you're climbing the rock, and you're pulling the, pulling the rope as you go, and those are the things that you do. When you're, when you're in the midst of doing that, you don't focus on the summit. You don't focus on the goal at the top of the mountain or at the top of the rock. Uh, what you're focusing on and what your eyes are going toward is the next handhold. The next foothold. You're looking right in front of you and you're looking for that next place to grab in order to have an anchor so that you can move forward. You're not looking where you're going to grab hold 10 minutes from now as you climb up the side of that rock. You're not looking, you're not looking, you have to, you know, you designate your path and there, you know, they decide what path they're going to take. But in the moment as you're hanging from that rock, you're looking right in front of you. You're trying to find the next handhold to grab, the next foothold to grab. Well, there's times when you're rock climbing, they call it a lead fall. When you have a lead fall, which is not a big deal, lots of climbers fall and you know, you're know you secured by an anchor rope, so you fall and you have to grab hold again and you have to start again. When, when you have a, a lead fall, you're hanging by that rope, you're hanging by that anchor rope, and really you're spinning and twisting in the wind and you know, you're just hanging there by that rope. And the first thing when you get steady and when you get your bearings back, the first thing that that rock climber does is look for a foothold. Look for a handhold. Look for something that's going to be steady where I can plant my feet under me and I can start moving forward again. Well, today, in, especially in this day and age and in all ages uh, since the birth of the church, Jesus has told us, and we looked at these passages in John, that we will have trials. It is inevitable. It is going to happen. And you know, when they come... It feels like you've been knocked down. It feels like you're swinging aimlessly by the guide rope and you don't know where uh, you're going to find your next foothold. You don't know how you're going to get to where you need to be. You're just swinging by this rope. And there are times when these things happen to us that we have to find a foothold. We have to find a place where we can grab hold that is sturdy and it's steady and it's not going to be moved. It's not going to shift under us. One of those places for me, uh, for years now, has been 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-9. through 9. So today, instead of moving ahead with Worship Connect Serve, we may do that next week, um, I just felt led to share with you one of my footholds uh, when trials come. One of my footholds and handholds that when I have to focus on uh, where, my, where my foot's going to fall next, uh, this is one of the passages that I go to. Um, the last time we were together, last week Charlie Davidson preached 
and uh, did a great job. But the last time I was here with you and I was sharing with you, we finished John chapter 16. And so in the next few weeks after we're uh, done with uh, revisiting our mission and our vision and what it means to uh, make disciples the way Jesus has commanded us as a church to do so, we'll start at, you know, in John 17 and we'll continue going on uh, that way. But the last thing that we read when I was here before you was the last part of John chapter 16. And in the last verse of John chapter 16, he told us this. Jesus has just gotten through uh, instructing His disciples uh, for the final time before He goes to the cross. He'll see them again after He's resurrected and instruct them for 40 days as well. But this is the last moment that He's going to uh, spend instructing His disciples. And we looked at all the things that He said through chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. And the last thing He says in chapter 16 is, I have said these things to you that in Me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so, as you read that, there are two promises right there, aren't they? The promises are diametrically opposed to one another. One is, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have tribulation. It's a fact. You can't get around it. You can't get over it. You can't get under it. But he also says that... He has overcome the world, and therefore we can have peace, even in the midst of these tribulations. Now, when you read that verse, when I read that verse, man, it just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? I mean, it's beautiful. It's powerful. And, and no doubt, it is true. It's absolutely true. And I believe it with all my heart. And I know if you're a believer in Christ, you believe it with all your heart as well. But the question that I have for myself and for you, and the question I want to answer today is, where do I go when I need it? You know, when I am twisting in the wind of trial, hanging by what feels like a thread, and it only feels that way because we're in Christ, we're not hanging by a thread, but when it feels that way, I need somewhere to plant my feet. I need somewhere to grab a handhold and that's going to be sturdy and steady and it's not going to give way under me. Where can I plant my anchor when these tribulations do come and these trials do come and I need to not only hear that promise but grab hold of that promise? Where do I go when I need to find this joy that's promised to me in the midst of trials? When tribulation and trial come like a flood, no matter what suffering, no matter what happens in this life, or things going on in my family, things going on in the world, things going on in our church, in our community, whatever it is that's coming, where do I go to find this joy that's been promised to me, this peace in the midst of tribulation? Today, I'm going to show you four footholds that I grab hold to when trial comes. And make no mistake, it's a fight to hold on to these footholds, to these handholds. Uh, trial comes, and I have to remind myself over and over again of these four things that we're going to look at from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. The first one is who we are in Christ. The foothold, the, the thing that we grab onto when we, we, we can't see the summit, we can't see uh, how we're going to reach the goal and trials and tribulations are coming like a flood and it seems like I'm overtaken. One of the footholds that I find solace in, peace in, joy in, in the midst of whatever's going on in this life is that who I am in Jesus Christ. Now before we read verses 3 through 6, I want to focus your attention just on verse 6 for a minute. He says, Peter says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Here you see both aspects. In this you rejoice. You have joy even at the same time that you're being grieved by these various trials. You can have joy in the midst of grieving over various trials that we have. He says, in this you rejoice. When you read that in verse 6, in this you rejoice, the immediate question that comes to mind is, in what? In what do we rejoice? And the answer to that question is found in verses 3 through 5. So let's read it together and then we'll take it apart piece by piece. 
In verse 3, after the introduction that Peter gives in this first epistle, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice." He's talking, of course, in that whole paragraph about who we have been made in Christ, how we have been born again, how we have an inheritance that is guarded for us, how we, by God's power ourselves, are being guarded through faith. So the first thing I want you to see is we kind of take this paragraph apart and look at it piece by piece and then put it back together to see how we rejoice in these trials is that He has said to us, that according to His great mercy, He's caused us to be born again to a living hope. In this we rejoice. We have been made new. We have been born again. If you have trusted in Christ, you are a new creature. And the old things have passed away. All things have become new. You now have His righteousness and His his perfection uh, applied to your account by faith and your sin and your uh, wretchedness and the curse of the fall and all of the things that uh, have separated you from God were placed upon His shoulders and He paid the penalty for those on the cross. And so we have been born again to, it says, a living hope. This hope is living because it cannot die. It imparts life. And when he talks about hope here, don't mistake that for the way that we use hope, the word hope. You know, when I I say I hope something, basically what I'm saying is um, I'm uncertain, but I really really wish it would happen. You know, if I said to you today, you know, I I really hope it doesn't rain this afternoon. I'm not saying to you, I I am just expecting beautiful skies today. What I'm saying is, man, I really wish it wouldn't rain. That's not how the Bible uses this word hope. In fact, you could translate this word as a confident expectation. It's not a just, I wish it, I wish it happened. I hope it happens. You know, I really wish this is the way it was. And I, I'm really holding out hope that this is how, how it's going to be. No, this is a confidence. He's caused us to be born again to this living, confident assurance. It's what we look forward to. It's our expectation knowing that He has promised it and therefore it shall come to pass. So when we talk about this word hope, we're not talking about just an uncertain you know, wish that this might, might take place. We're talking about the confidence that we have knowing that He who promised is able. He who promised is faithful. And this hope that we have, this this living hope because we've been born again, I want you to notice here, it's not based on what we do or what we don't do. Did you see that in verse 3? He says, it is according to His great mercy that He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And it's not by our performance, it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's according to His mercy and it's through the resurrection. He has done the work to provide us with this confident expectation, to provide us with this living hope, to cause us to be born again through His resurrection. It's because we, by grace through faith, are united with Him. And because we are united with Jesus Christ, we have this living hope based on His mercy and because of His love and because of His sending His Son, we are united with Jesus Christ by grace through faith and His righteousness is applied to us. His death is my death. Therefore, the wages of sin is death, but my death has already been paid. Jesus Christ paid it. And His life of perfect living before the Father, perfectly keeping the law of God, doing what Adam could not do, doing what Israel could not do, it was done in Jesus Christ and His life is applied to my life. And because of this, we have a living hope, not because of how good I'm doing. 
It's not because of how well I am wading through trials or how great I am persevering or how wonderful my works are today. It has been given to us to be born again to this living hope according to His great mercy and through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and no other thing is added to that hope. And He describes this living hope, this being born again as an inheritance. You see it? Verse 4, we have been born again to this living hope through the resurrection from the dead. To an inheritance. We have been born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Understand, we have, the Bible says, been made co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We are born again to this inheritance, born into the family of God now, having an inheritance because we are now in Jesus Christ, children of the King, sons and daughters of the King. The King's possessions are our inheritance. We have, because we are His children and have this inheritance, we have open access to the King. No more is The way blocked. No more is the veil over the Holy of Holies. It has been rent. It has been thrown aside. And we are welcomed into His presence because we have been united with Christ. What the Father says of Christ, He now says of His children. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Today, if you know Christ, He says that of you. He says that of me. Not because I'm pleasing, because I guarantee you and I can assure you that I'm not pleasing. My heart is not pleasing. My mind is not pleasing. My thoughts and my actions are not pleasing. And it has been mirrored over the last three or four days in my own life. A telescope has been put upon the fact of things in my life, personality, thoughts, my, my faith that are not pleasing to God. But it's not about me being pleasing. It is about Him being pleasing. And that's why our inheritance is sure. And it's eternal. Do you see the the adjectives that he uses to describe your inheritance here? It's imperishable. Means it can never be ruined. It can never be destroyed. It's impossible that it will ever perish in any way, shape, or form. It is imperishable. He also says it's undefiled. Meaning, there's nothing that can put a stain upon it. Nothing can cheapen this inheritance that we have. There's nothing that can put the slightest blemish of sin upon our inheritance. It is undefiled. And he also says it's unfading, which means it can't wear out. (laughs) It can't get old. It can't lose its value. Our inheritance is eternal and it's everlasting. It cannot be altered. Church, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of trials, in the midst of the things that plague us, even if COVID wasn't going on right now, it would be something else. Jesus said, in this life you will have tribulation, but in the midst of these trials we can understand that we have been born again to a living hope, an inheritance that is imperishable. It cannot fade away. It cannot be defiled by anything that goes on in this life or in our own hearts. But He doesn't just leave it there. Even if that was where it ended, I mean, that would be enough. That would be enough of a foothold for me to grab onto and to say, okay, this is where I'm planting my foot. This is where I'm holding on and I will not not falter to trust that it is true. But that's not where He leaves it. He says that we have this inheritance in verse 4. It's imperishable, undefiled, unfading. And this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. It's kept in heaven for you. He shows how it is impossible, how it is possible that a sinner like me can have such an inheritance, can be born again and have such of a hope. It is kept in heaven for you. 
It is guarded by God Himself in heaven for you, ready to be revealed in the last day. We have it. It is is our possession right now, but our possession right now is kept and guarded in heaven for you. And what I want you to see here also is in verse 5, it's not just our inheritance that is kept for us, it is us who are kept for our inheritance. Do you see it in verse 5? He said it's kept. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. And then he says, you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Not only, church, is it kept for you. Not only do you receive it not by what you do or don't do, but because of what Jesus Christ has done, but you don't maintain it by what you do or don't do. He says, who by God's power, he's talking about you, the ones kept, the inheritance kept in heaven for you, and you are the ones who by God's power are being guarded. You are being guarded through faith for this salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. It doesn't mean you're waiting on it uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, I really hope I get there. It means that it is your present possession, but one day it will be consummated and there will be no more trials. There will be no more sin. There will be nothing but glory and worship and living in the presence of God for all eternity. And you are being guarded through faith by God's power for that salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. Now you say, and I say, and I've said it many times in the last few days, I believe that. I really do. I really, really do. But how is it possible I mean, I know I'm such a failure. I know my heart. I know my own sin. I know the things that I the things that I do and don't do. Understand, it is guarded for us because of Jesus Christ and what He has done. On Wednesday nights, we are going through Genesis, and we began we begun I don't know maybe four or five weeks ago, and so we're we're just now finishing chapter three, and we've talked about the fall, we've talked about Adam and Eve uh, being cast out of the garden, and we've had man we've had some great discussions about that, and we've learned a lot of things as we've been walking through that, and one of the one of the most um, I guess tragic would be the right word. One of the most tragic things through that is that God exiled Adam and Eve from the garden and He put two cherubim, two angels with flaming swords at the garden, at the door of the Garden of Eden to keep man from coming back and eating of the tree of life. These these cherubim, these angels, were tasked to do what Adam was supposed to do, which is to keep and to guard the garden. So understand that tragedy at the end of Genesis chapter 3 where God puts these guards with flaming swords to block the way that man cannot come back into the presence of God. He cannot come back into the paradise of God. He cannot come back and eat of the tree of life and have eternal life. That same picture in my mind, it came to me thinking about verse 5 when it says, Now we are not guarded as sinners kept away from the presence of God, but now those those two cherubim, if you could say it that way, are set on the outside of the garden and we are brought into God's presence and now we are being guarded through faith for this salvation that's ready to be revealed. Understand, in this we rejoice. Though for time there will be trials, he says. In this you rejoice. In this your hope, your inheritance, the fact that you are kept by God, even in the midst of falling off the rock, even in the midst of twisting in the wind of trials. Church, this is one of the first footholds that I always go to when I'm twisting in the wind and when trials come and I don't know where to turn next. We rejoice in who He's made us through Christ. So it doesn't matter... It doesn't matter if I have to go through 25 failures. It doesn't matter if I step in the same mud hole 12 times. It doesn't matter in the sense of my salvation and who Jesus Christ has made me about what trials and what sufferings and what things come in this life. I know who I have believed in and I know whom He has made me in Himself. Even in the hardest sorrows. I can rejoice in that fact. The second foothold I want to show you in this passage is that trials are only for a season. 
Notice what he says in verse 6. After he finishes talking about the inheritance and the being born again, how God is keeping the inheritance for us and he's guarding us for the inheritance, he says, look, in this you rejoice, though now, and look at these three words, for a little while, four words I guess technically, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. I'm going to tell you what, it's easy, it's easy to lose hope when we go through things in this life. And many of you have been through far worse trials than I probably will ever go through. But it's easy to lose hope when we start thinking about you know, this is never going to change. It's always going to be this way. I used to be, of course, you know, I used to be a chaplain at a hospital, and that hospital had uh, a rehab center where uh, drug rehab, alcoholic rehab, you know, all kind of different things. And that was one of the major things when counseling people who were caught up in these addictions or caught up in these, um, these issues of life was the loss of hope. It's never going to change. I'm never going to get through this. I'm never going to be able to do this. Peter knocks that completely completely out of the park with these little words, though now, for a little while, if it's necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. That implies something huge, that there is going to be a time when these trials are over. They're only going to grieve us for a little while. They only last for a season. Now, when I say that, immediately the question pops into your mind, well, how long is a season? How long is a little while? To be honest with you, I don't know. Is it a week? Is it a month? Is it 10 months? Is it five years? Is it your whole life? We're told in this book, we're told in the very first verse from John chapter 16 that I read to you, that in this life, we will have tribulation. But the reality is, even if that's so, listen to me, even if from right now, today, this moment, from right now until however long I have on this earth, if there is nothing but trial and suffering and tribulation and sorrow in my life, there is still going to come a day because of who Jesus is that trial and suffering will be no more. This life, the Bible says, is just a vapor compared to eternity. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us or in us. These trials will not be forever. Not for you who know Christ. There's coming a day when all things will be made right. There's coming a day when there will be no more suffering, no more trial, no more heartache, no more tribulation. There's coming a day when the head of the serpent will be crushed for good and he'll be cast into the lake of fire. And you know, the, the older I get, the more I'm looking forward to that day. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let him hear my voice. Cares are past. I'm home at last, ever to rejoice. These trials are only for a season. Eternal life is true life. It's real life. It's not just ghosts floating around in the clouds somewhere. We're going to have a new heavens and a new earth. We're going to walk in the garden in the cool of the day with our Savior because of what Jesus did. The earth will be returned, a new heavens and a new earth, to what God had initially designed in Eden for us. We have life. So one of the things that I grab hold of in the midst of trials is that these trials are only for a season. They will not last for all time. The third thing I want to show you, the third foothold that we grab onto is that God, even in this, is in control. He's in control of our trials. He is in control of these things. And I get this from these two little words that stand out in verse 6. If this, in this you rejoice, we talked about what in this is, all of those things. In this you rejoice, though now for a while, and notice these two little words, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. He doesn't say, though, though now for a little while you've been grieved by various trials. As if, you know, I'm sorry, this thing's just jumped on you, didn't really know it was going to happen. You know, darn, we need to really try to work through this. I wish it hadn't happened. No, he says, if you're having these trials, 
He says, you can rejoice in who you are in Christ, the inheritance that He's given you, though now for a while, listen, if you've been grieved by these various trials, you can make sure and trust that it is necessary. When He says, if necessary, He's implying here, He's stating, in fact, that there is a purpose. If you're grieved by various trials, there's a reason for it. There's a purpose for it. God is using it for your good, for your benefit. How do you know that, Jason? Why would it be necessary to go through these trials? He tells us in the next sentence, verse 7, so that, this is the reason, you have been, he says, while it is, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, and this is why those trials have happened, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may fi- be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's so that our faith can be tested and refined and purified. And when it is so tested and purified, it glorifies God. That's why we're here, to glorify God. It's not to be happy or be comfortable, although I love to be happy and I love to be comfortable. That's not the reason we're here. We're here to glorify Christ and to make disciples in His name. And as we grow closer to Jesus in our walk, we will be tested We will be tried. He he compares it here to the refining of gold. More precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. When when people find gold in the mountains or or in, you know, panning in the streams or whatever uh, place they find gold, it's always filled with impurities. It's It's not pure gold, and therefore it's less valuable than pure gold. So what the goldsmith does is he takes this this gold that he has found out in the in the ground somewhere and he puts it in the fire and he heats that gold until the gold breaks apart and it starts to melt and as it melts the impurities and the garbage and the things that are in there they come to the top and that goldsmith takes and skims off that layer of garbage that's found in that gold and when that gold cools and it hardens again it's purified That's what he's talking about. When trials come, they serve the purpose of purifying our faith. They serve the purpose of showing us impurities and idols and and things that we have glommed onto. Places that when we're climbing the rock, rock, maybe we have grabbed hold of that uh, that won't hold us and we need a better grip. He shows us by these things that these trials that come that grieve us, they're necessary so that the tested genuineness of our faith is found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now understand what I'm saying. I understand when you get put in the fire, it hurts. It's no fun. But the result of this process, uh, in what Peter tells us here, is that when you come out the other end, when that gold comes out the other end of the refiner's fire, it is stronger, it is more valuable, it is purer. Is purer a word? More pure? It is more pure than what it was before. When we come through the fire of trials, it's necessary to refine us, to make us more dependent upon Jesus, to make us flee from self-reliance and our own strength and the idols that we grab hold of that that we think can uh, preserve us and give us comfort and happiness and ease. Those things are purged by the fire of trial when we have nothing left to turn to except Jesus Christ and His faithfulness and relationship with Him that causes us to grow. Oh yes, God is in control of our trials. That's why in James chapter 1 it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And what we need to do is let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is what God is doing in our trials. He is purifying us. He's removing the junk, the idols, the things that we grab hold of. Church, our trials, whatever they may be, the trials that you're experiencing in your family, the trials that you're experiencing at your job or 
you know, the trials that we're experiencing in our community, whatever sufferings and trials and things that you go through, understand that God is in control of these things. They're not random. You have not, if you are in Jesus Christ, you have not been abandoned to your trials and to your suffering. So the fourth foothold I want to show you. The first one was that I know who I am in Christ. Who we are in Christ is a foothold that we grab onto when, when we can't see anything else. The second thing is trials and the sufferings of this life are only for a season. They're not permanent. They're not eternal. They will pass. And the third thing is that God is in control of all these trials anyway, and He is doing so, doing these things and using these things for my good to refine my faith and to produce in me steadfastness. And the last foothold that I have to grab onto over and over again is that I know in whom I have believed. I know, it is, I know in whom I have placed my trust. Verse 8, Peter tells this, his readers, he says, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. When the foothold, when the rug is pulled out from under me, this is one of the footholds that I grab onto, that I look for, that I focus on. He tells his readers, listen, Peter sent this letter far and wide to the diaspora, to all the people that were spread out. There's no way that Peter knew for a fact every person who was going to read this letter. There's certainly no way he could have known all down through the centuries as God uh, passed it through the hands of His church as His Scripture. But yet he says in verse 8, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Peter saw with physical eyes Jesus, walked with Him for three years, saw the risen Jesus. The people that this letter was sent to, more often than not, past chapter 8 of Acts, they had never seen the risen Jesus. They had never seen the physical Jesus. When the gospel went to the Gentile world and all of those things, they had never seen Jesus. But yet he says, though you have not ever seen Him, He can say with full assurance, you love Him. He can say to all believers, though you have not seen Him with physical eyes, you love Him. He can say that as a certainty, even not knowing who all would read this letter because it is a fact for all those who have trusted Christ because it is a work of the Holy Spirit in your heart that you love Jesus. Today, none of us here in Mulvane in 2020 have ever laid our physical eyes upon Jesus Christ. But if you've been born again, your heart has been changed and you love Him because it's God's work in you. And if you see that, even as frail as it is, even as faulty as it is, even not a perfect love and failings and sufferings and trials and all kind of things seem to be plaguing your heart at any given moment, if you can see in that heart that, yes, I love Him, you have such assurance that Jesus is yours and you are His. For that is a work of God in your heart. But He's talking to these people who are going through these trials and He says it's necessary that you go through these trials and it's, uh, it's only for a little while that you go through these trials. But as they go through these trials, look what He says. He says, though you do not now see Him, yet you believe. You're going through these trials. He even says you're grieved by these trials. And you look around and all I can see is bad. All I can see is darkness. All I can see is trials. All I can see is my own failures. All I can see is attacks coming from the left and coming from the right. But he says, look, even though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him. You trust in the one who has promised, and the one who has promised is able to keep the promises that he has given. He says, and because you believe in him, because you've trusted him, you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible. And you rejoice with a joy that is filled with glory. The one thing that we can understand for certainty, even when we can't see him, 
when we can't see what He's doing, when we have a hard time seeing that these trials are for my good and they're refining my faith, even when we cannot see it, we can indeed trust that the One who promised is able. He knows me. He loves me. He's caused me to be born again, and He will keep me. Though you do not see Him, you believe in Him, and therefore, because we have trusted Him, because it is a person that we have put our faith in, Jesus Christ, we can rejoice with a joy that just goes beyond expression. No matter what's going on in this life, a few years ago, I say a few years ago, it's probably been 10 years now, um, I had like heart issues that were going on. And I remember laying in the bed one night and I, I honestly thought I was going to have a heart attack. I honestly thought I was going to die because chest was hurting, you know, and uh, all of that that goes with it, you know, dizziness and uh, feel your heart beating and it was erratic and it was just, it was just awful. It was, a, it was a horrible thing. And I, I thought to myself, you know, that I, I'm going to die before the morning. I'm going to be gone. And the thought came to my mind. Now, remember, I, I'm, I've studied theology. I know my Bible relatively well. I, you know, I call myself a, a, a mature Christian. You know, I don't know how true that is. But uh, I'm laying there, and these thoughts came to my mind like, I can't go yet. I'm not ready. I'm not good enough to stand before God tonight. I've got to fix this, and I've got to fix that, and I've got to get these things right, and I've got to stop this, and I've got to start doing this. And then as those thoughts were running through my mind, I just realized, that's not right. That's not true. That's not the gospel at all. What are you doing in this moment where it was just panic and fear and all of this just grabbed onto me? My first instinct as a fallen human being was run as far away from the gospel as I possibly could. And when it, it was revealed to me and I realized what I was doing, I'm like... No, I'm going to rest in Jesus Christ. And if He's not enough, then I'm not going because I put all my eggs in that basket. And so He says, though you don't see Him, you believe Him. And even when all of this stuff attacks from every direction, you can rejoice. That night when I, did, when I realized what was happening in my mind and my heart, and I said, no, 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 I'm just going to trust that Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. I was able to rejoice even in the midst of me thinking I was having a heart attack. Even in the midst of me thinking death was going to take me before the morning, I was able to relax. I was able to rest. I was able to have joy knowing that even if that were to happen, that I would be in the presence of the one whom my soul loves. It's a joy that's inexpressible and it's filled with glory. Understand, church, in times of trial, listen, you can hear this and say, you know, though you don't see Him, you believe, and therefore you can rejoice with joy that's inexpressible and filled with glory. When times of trial are upon you, you'll say the same as me, I know that's true. I believe that that's true, but I just can't see it. I can't feel it. What we have to understand is it doesn't matter how you feel. Your feelings are lying to you. A foothold and a handhold to grab onto in the midst of trial and suffering are not your feelings. They're not your heart. They're not your intentions. They have nothing to do with you. If you grab a foothold or a handhold uh, in the midst of trial that has anything with, to do with how you are doing or how you are thinking or how you are feeling at the moment, that will not be a sturdy handhold for you. That will not be a place where you can plant your foot with full assurance saying, I know that I will be able to stand here because our hearts and our minds are deceptive and desperately wicked, Jeremiah chapter 16 says. Feelings are a loose gravel, not a foothold. The worst thing, the worst theology in the world is all of these different places that tell you to follow your heart. Don't follow your heart. You follow the word of Jesus Christ because He is able to keep His promise. Your heart is not able to do anything. 
And so, because of this, because we have this inheritance and we know who we are in Christ, because we know that these trials are for a season, we know that God is in control of these trials, and we know in whom we have put our trust. Nothing to do with our circumstances, our trials, our comfort, our own heart, our own mind, but in whom we have believed, we know, verse 9, that we are obtaining the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our soul even when I can't see it at all. Even when I have fallen and I'm swinging by a rope looking for a place to grab onto. Even when I don't understand what's happening. I can know that there is a foothold for me. There is a handhold for me to grab onto in the midst of trials. Understand, believer, if you've trusted in Jesus, you've been born again, your heart loves him and you can see that love even if you're failing over and over and over again you can see that heart that loves him and understand that means you have been rescued that means that this life right here is all the hell that you'll ever have because when we depart from this life it's nothing but glory and peace in the presence of jesus christ this is all the hell that you'll ever experience. But if you don't know Jesus, I want you to also understand this life, this is all the heaven you'll ever have. This is as good as it gets. It's all downhill from here. So ask yourself today as we close this message, don't ask yourself, have I prayed the prayer? Don't ask yourself, have I walked the aisle? Don't ask yourself, don't ask yourself, you know, did I do, did I, did I repeat after the preacher good enough? Or did I really, really mean it? Ask yourself this one question. Do I truly love Jesus? There's no better barometer, no better measuring stick, no better plumb line. Do I love Jesus? I understand we, nobody wants to go to hell. Nobody wants to be uh, punished. Nobody, everybody wants to go to heaven. We all want to have bliss. We all want to be happy. I understand all that. But the question in the midst of all of this is, do I love Jesus? And if you can look in your heart and say, you know, I just don't see much love for Jesus there. Run to the cross. Cast yourself upon his mercy. Trust in him. Give your heart and life to him. Sign over the title deed of who you are to Jesus Christ and trust in him. And you will have an inheritance that's imperishable, it's undefiled, and it's unfading that is kept in heaven for you and you guarded by the power of God through faith for it. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. God, I pray that you would watch over our hearts, God, as we fight to trust you. God, I pray that you would be with us as we try to navigate all of the ins and outs of these times and the things that are going on. God, I pray that you would help us to understand that you are in control. And God, we just want to do the things that are honoring to you. And we want to love one another in your name. We want to take care of your body. We want to, uh, God, we want to make disciples as you have commanded us to do. That is our goal and our mission. Lord, I pray that anybody under the sound of my voice, whether it be today, this Sunday, or if they're listening to this 10 weeks from now or years from now, God, I pray that you would uh, speak to them and that you would call them unto yourself, that you would give uh, give them the strength to call upon you, to trust in you, to give their heart and life to you, and then to grab someone and tell them, today I've given my heart to Jesus. Today I'm trusting him. Father, we love you, and I pray that you would be with us as we grow through this time. Help us to grab hold of the footholds that you've given us, the promises, the sureties that we have, the assurance that we know in whom we have believed. We love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. O great God of highest heaven, Occupy my lowly heart Don't it all and reign supreme Conquer every rebel power And let no vice or sin remain That resists your holy war You have loved 
and purchase me and make me yours forevermore. And I was blinded by my sin, had no ears to hear your voice, did not know your love within had no taste for heaven's joys but then your spirit gave me life and opened up your word to me through the gospel of your son and gave me endless hope and Help me now to live a life that's dependent on your grace. I keep my heart and guard my soul from the evils that I face. And you are worthy to be praised with my every thought and deed. And, oh, great God of highest heaven, glorify your name through me. And you are worthy to be praised with my every thought and deed. And, oh, great God, of highest heaven glorify your name through me glorify your name through me amen have a great sunday